But Paul is saying here that if you are truly Israel and really become Israel, one of your natural rights, according to the doctrine of election in the flesh, within this holy order program, one of your natural rights that you ought to know of and seek for is, as he puts it here, not only the adoption, but the glory. You have a right to live with a cloud and smoke by day over your house and a pillar of fire by night. You have that right. That is your legitimate right. You came here in the blood of Israel, born with that right and that privilege. But you've got to do the work that builds to that right, and that is to be justified in Christ and sanctified and to receive those blessings of the gospel and purity and the sealing powers, and then the full rights of Israel can be unfolded, see? All right, so they have the right then to the adoption and the glory and the covenants, and these covenants are those of the house of the Lord in addition to the covenants of adoption. And the giving of the law, Israel has a right then to give the law. The law shall go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem as a result of this giving the right law and their rights to do so. See. And the service of God and the promises, see. Now all Israel are not Israel which are of Israel. That's one point. Now another point is this, that Zion is not truly Mount Zion until she is built upon her mount. A person in the cavalry is really not a soldier of the cavalry until he's mounted on his white charger or whatever he's riding, right? He's not really a person in the cavalry is until really he's not on his mount, a soldier of the cavalry until he's mounted on his white charger or whatever he's riding, right? He's not really what he's designed to be until he's on his mount, okay? Now, the mount of Zion is the temple of the Lord. It's the covenants of the Lord. It's the sealing power. It's the endowment of glory. That's Mount Zion. And when we, Zion becomes Mount Zion, then there will be a cloud and smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night, see? Now, Isaiah speaks, then, of this great end Zion. And I'd like to turn with you to the Book of Mormon, where it bring up now one of these things we didn't get time to talk about yesterday. Uh, and these, then, are the Isaiah passages. And I'd like particularly to deal with uh, Isaiah chapter 11, uh, which is first or second Nephi chapter 21. Uh, <clears throat> Isaiah does something like we genealogists do. In order to show your pedigree, you uh, utilize the tree as a symbol, don't you? The great genealogical tree. And you got the trunk, whose great-granddad or great-great or someone, say, way back there. He's the trunk. <clears throat> and then you've got a big limb that goes out. And then you got another limb that goes out. And then you got a branch that goes out. And then you got a twig that goes out. And then you got some leaves that are on the twig. And very proudly you say, hey, that's me. Isn't that what you do? <clears throat> All right, now, so you use the symbol of the tree to portray your genealogy. Now, Isaiah uses the symbol of a plant to portray presiding figures in the holy order that will be built up to usher in the millennial kingdom of Christ. That's what Isaiah 11 is all about. And he starts out and says, there should come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Now, who's Jesse? Well, it's David's father. How is that tied in with the doctrine of election in the flesh? In Israel, the house of Israel, there are three main lineages in which the Lord has placed sacred powers. The presiding lineage is that of Ephraim. It's the birthright. It carries the right to build the temple. It carries the right to teach the gospel. It carries the right to the sealing powers of the holy priesthood. It carries the right to the office of high priest over the holy order. It carries that right. And it carries the right to bestow the blessings 
of the gospel and the temple upon others. And this is why the ten tribes will come to Ephraim and be crowned with glory in honor then of recognition of Ephraim's role as the firstborn. Right? This is the presiding one. This is the office of priest in the term priest and king. And actually it ought to be priest and king rather than king and priest because the priestly power supersedes in rights and prerogatives the kingly power. All right, uh, and then there's another uh, body of Israel, and this then is Levi. And what does Levi have? He has the right then to the preparatory gospel. That's an important function. He has also a li right then to the law of sacrifice, symbolic of Christ, and portraying, fore foretelling the coming of Christ. And so the preparatory gospel, the law of sacrifice. If you read Exodus chapter 28 very carefully, you'll find that Aaron also had an, another right, that he had a prophetic right, a prophetic right that uh, was given to him under Moses. It's an order of prophets under Moses. And as such, he had a right then to the ephod of God, which is a dress and a garment, so designed that it has within it the Urim and Thummim. And he has the right then to the Urim and Thummim and to the, uh, to the Syriac powers of the Urim and Thummim, see. And so Levi is a very important thing. He's prophet, he's preparatory gospel, he's the law of sacrifice in his rights and privileges. And then in Israel, the royal power, the kingly power, then is in the house of David. And this is the David line with... All right, now, in, in this particular statement, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Now, we know then that this relates to David. We know then that it pertains to the rights and the privileges that are given by divine appointment to that branch. And he says, And a branch shall grow out of his root. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And this hymn, then, the antecedent is, is uh, uh, the stem of Jesse. And the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, and shall make him quick in understanding. Now, this is a statement about Christ. Christ is the stem of Jesse. If you read section 113, the prophet answers certain questions now in relation to this. And the question is asked there in, in that revelation to which the prophet gives a revelatory answer. Uh, who is the stem of Jesse spoken of? And he says, Thus saith the Lord, it's Christ. And then he says, What is the rod spoken of? In the first verse of the 11th chapter, that should come of the stem of Jesse. And he says, Behold, thus saith the Lord, it is a servant in the hands of Christ who is partly a descendant of Jesse, that is, of the Davidic line, as well as of Ephraim, and that gives him the birthright role. And the two are combined into one. Uh, he says, uh, he's of the, Jesse and Ephraim of the house of Joseph, on whom there is laid much power. And then he had a root, the question is, what is the root of Jesse spoken of in the 10th verse of the 11th chapter? And the answer is, behold, thus saith the Lord, it is the descendant of Jesse, of this bloodline of, of uh, the royal power, as well as of Joseph, having the birthright privileges and the two combined, he says, unto whom rightly belongs the priesthood and the keys of the kingdom for an ensign and for the gathering of my people in the last days. Now note when the, Isaiah speaks of this in verse 10. He says, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will set his hand again the second time. Now, the root of Jesse is the prophet Joseph Smith. He rightfully holds the keys of the kingdom. There are two enzymes to be raised in the last days. One is the enzyme of the root of Jesse, Joseph. You've got to reveal who he was, his prophetic mission, his doctrine, his teachings, his plan of righteous society and government. This is raising the ensign of the root of Jesse. And on this root, on this ensign, going back and revealing Joseph and what he gave to us, 
On this enzyme, then, Zion will be built as an enzyme and standard to the nations. And you gather, then, people uh, on that basis. And so we need to get back to the revelation of the prophet in order finally to do this thing. Well, I've run out of time, and we've got to go on, but we'll take a break and maybe answer some questions, and then I'd still like to come back and get in this. Maybe we can finally work it in in the last subject where we want to talk about Christ coming now to, to Zion, and he's coming to the Jews, and he's coming in glory in the, cl in the clouds to the world. See, How can we uh, take time for just and we'll uh, stand and, and uh, we'll come back to this, to this subject. Got some left over here. Uh, when will the fullness of the priesthood be available in the temples? And I suspect the answer to that is when we get sanctified and qualified for it. I suspect that's the answer. How righteous can a husband become who sees that he begets, he gets to the temple often? It does not help see what his wife is able to go with him. If his wife isn't able to go with him, then he's got some kind of restriction there, hasn't he? See? And it gets back to the idea of be not unequally yoked together, see. You have to just work these things out, and that doesn't often leave your wife if you've got a situation like that, or a wife should run off and leave the husband. Sometimes the reward of righteousness requires a lot of patience. A lot of patience. I got a daddy-in-law who's one of the finest men I have ever known, most honest man that I have ever known. He was raised in an old Mormon family who left the church over polygamy. The worst thing he could say if he really got riled at an animal was, you dirty Mormon SOB. That was the worst thing he could say. And he put that word Mormon in there in big bold letters. <clears throat> he married one of the finest women I have ever known. Statement in her prelegate and her patriarchal blessing, the Lord promises her that none of her posterity will ever be lost. She is a woman of extreme integrity and great character. She married this ideal man, and he is an ideal man. The bad thing about it was he was so much better than the bishops in our ward that he didn't see any reason why he ought to join the church. His wife couldn't go to the temple, though. And in that sense, then, uh, she didn't have that privilege for a long time. Well, I joined the family, and we had some interesting times. <clears throat> he used to bring up the argument of polygamy every time the home teachers would come around and bend him a little bit and lean on him. One time he did that with me, and the Spirit of the Lord was given to me in rich abundance like I have seldom had it. And I could explain that principle to him to where he couldn't deny. And when I got him in the corner where he couldn't deny, and I just sat there and looked at him in the eye and laughed him right in the teeth. And just literally, verbally cuffed him and kicked him. And challenged him, if you're honest now, you're going to believe the gospel. That was an interesting time. The guy doesn't do that to his daddy in law very often because he was, he was pretty physically agile. Well, he had his pet argument destroyed. He was a man of extreme independence and extreme honesty, and he finally got a testimony. It cost him a heart attack. It cost him a, pay, a blessing from him, the, the state president who he was a good friend with. He told me, he says, when that man walked in that door to give me a blessing, I knew that if he would bless me, I'd live. Well, then he gets this testimony, and then he... Then he's in a dilemma because his whole family are anti-Mormons. Then he wonders how he's going to get baptized, how he can do it, and how he can reverse this whole course of his life, and yet he's a man of extreme integrity and honesty. Well, we went up there to visit uh, Christmas time one time, and I'd gone out to visit my folks, and Helen May was him, and he followed her around all day long. And he'd kind of mention once in a while, maybe maybe I ought to get married for my wife's sake. I mean, get join the church for my wife's sake. <laughs> I didn't say too much. <laughs> but finally, when I got back, why well, she enlightened me on what was happening. So in the evening we were talking, and somehow he brought it around again. I just walked over to the phone, dialed the bishop, 
says, Bishop, my daddy-in-law wants to be baptized, and I'd like to do it tomorrow in the morning. Can we do it at 9 o'clock? <laughs> and he says, I appreciate it. If you'd make all the arrangements, let's go here to the Stake Tabernacle, Rexburg, and let's get it done. And I'd be happy like to do that, and he'd like to be baptized, and I hung the phone up, and that was it. Well, we baptized him, confirmed him, went to the temple later. As I say, he's one of the most honest men that I have ever known, really. His wife was just a jewel, one of the finest cooks I ever saw, too. <laughs> really. Well, what do you do? She didn't nag him. She just lived quietly and uh, taught the gospel quietly. And somehow, through the process of osmosis, <coughs> the Spirit got from her to him. And, uh, and she found it. Well, that's how you handle things, see. Sometimes you have to do that. Now, she had kicked up her heels and left him. I don't know. Uh, <coughs> what is the law of obedience and sacrifice? The law of obedience simply means that. Obey. First law of heaven is obedience. Jesus learned that one and learned it so well that it made him the firstborn of, of all the creations that pertain to this order of worlds to which we belong. Obedience. And by obedience, then, all other things flowed. If you can't learn obedience, none of the other principles really amount to anything in the final analysis. Obey. Submit yourself to the Lord. Submit yourself to your bishop's counsel. Pray for him. Submit yourself to your state president. Do that. Obey. I don't care whether he's wrong, right, or indifferent. Obey. Simply do that. That's the law of obedience. And sometimes you'll have to couple with sacrifice, but it'll cost you, see. Sacrifice means that you finally put everything on the altar. Okay, Adam, son of man of holiness, his physical body, please explain. I dare not explain that. I don't want to. Uh, the scriptures say that he was the son of God. And uh, there's a lot of theory around, and until the prophet says something on that, any theory, even if it happens to be true, is false. I don't know whether you know that or not. There's two principles on which something is true. One is the letter is true, and the substance of the idea is true. The other is that that letter has to be infused with and quickened by and carried by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we call that the Spirit of Truth. And that's the living word. And if it doesn't have the living word in it, even if the letter is true, it is false, because it is not right. God doesn't honor it. Now, there are a lot of theories around in the church, and they're false. Why? I don't care whether they're true or false in substance. They are false because the Lord has not said anything more through our living prophet. And he has counseled us in past prophets to leave that subject alone. Okay? Adam was born. He had a physical body. The genealogy of your flesh, if you trace it back, to go back to man of holiness. You are not a trinket. God didn't get busy in his workshop and figure out some little thing that looked like a man and he blew on it. And it became alive, and that's man, that's a trinket. We are the race of the gods. We come through him both spirit and body. He is our father. The physical endowments are those given to us by the law of generation. They're corrupt, we're in fallen state, but when we go back, we'll be like him because that's how we were in the first place, see? Now, leave it alone beyond that. Just leave it alone and help build the kingdom. Okay, why do you say that the Isthmus of Panama is not the narrow neck? One reason is just the logic of it. You don't hunt in North America and live in South America when you're riding on burrows. <laughs> now, you think about that and you pray about that and don't spread that all over the church that Andrew said that. <laughs> I don't want to write any letters. <laughs> I just want to suggest an idea that you think about. There's a lot to that Book of Mormon that's great and good, but it's not designed to be 
a book of geography. It's not designed that way. We hassle this thing. Camorra where? Was it down in Central America somewhere or up there? Well, that's it. Should we quit? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. That's it. We have to say, I don't know, and you can quote me. <laughs> and that's the essence of it. Well, let's stand up and take a break. <laughs> I was working in my office one day, a knock came to the door, invited the person in, it was a young man. He had a very perplexed look on his face, rather highly charged emotionally. And uh, as he came into the office, he blurted out, Brother Andrus, do you believe in the second coming? <clears throat> and I said, yes, I believe in the second coming. And he came rapid fire right back. <clears throat> Which second coming? And I just kind of stood there. <clears throat> and I says, what do you mean? <clears throat> Which second coming? And he says, have you got a Bible? <clears throat> So I handed him my sacred volume. <clears throat> he knew his way around in it, at least to find the passages he wanted. <clears throat> he turned over to Malachi chapter 3, <clears throat> read the first verse. <clears throat> Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who shall abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he's like refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He says, is that the second coming? I said, that's talking about the reappearance of Christ. He's going to come as he comes to his temple. And I was about ready to try to explain. He said, I don't want an explanation. <clears throat> I blinked. And he said, I just want to know, is that talking about the second coming? I said, yes, sir. Then he turned rather rapidly <clears throat> over to the book of Zechariah, to the 14th chapter, and began with the fourth verse, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Which, shall, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a great valley, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north and half toward the south. He says, is that talking about the second coming? <clears throat> and I made the mistake again. Yeah, that's the second coming, and that's talking about Christ coming to the Mount of Olives, and I started to explain. He says, I don't want an explanation. <clears throat> I just want to know. Is that the second coming? <clears throat> so I says, okay, you got it. Then he turned rather rapidly over to the epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians. And there in the epistle to the Thessalonians, uh, Paul writes here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, <clears throat> Begin with verse 15. <clears throat> For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, that is, those who have died. <clears throat> For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, that's Michael, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. He says, is that the second coming? And I just simply said, yes, when he comes in. He says, okay, which of these is the second coming? How can Jesus be in his temple, be on the Mount of Olives, and be way up there in the air? You got me up in the air. <coughs> which is the second coming? Well, I calmed him down. <coughs> And I says, hey, you've got the idea that the second coming is going to happen all one afternoon, probably a Sunday afternoon when all the saints are fishing here in the ballpark. <laughs> and it's going to come rather suddenly. It's all going to be wrapped, wrapped up in one great cataclysmic event. Now, that simply is not true. Get your premise correct. The second coming is a series of appearances uh, consummating in that great climax appearance where the veil is rent and he appears in mighty glory and power in the clouds of heaven. Prior to that, he will make several appearances. And each of these major appearances, distinguished between several and major now, each of these major appearances has a purpose. A purpose designed to further develop and to build the kingdom of God so that when he finally gets through all of his appearances, he will then be able to initiate an institute a universal order of law and government and peace and righteousness on earth. Now, for example, let me turn uh, to a statement by President Charles W. Penrose. Charles W. Penrose was a member of the First Presidency and one of the great scriptural <coughs> minds in the church in his day. And he writes an article, this is clear back in 1859, <coughs> in which he talks about the Second Coming. And he makes some explanations that, that uh, are meaningful and gives us a position from which to analyze the scriptures, a place to stand a view to take as we meet the challenge of studying out the prophetic picture of the latter day. He says, for example, through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as revealed through the prophet Joseph Smith, many among all nations will be led to forsake the traditions of their fathers and become numbered with the people of God. These will be gathered to one place, to prepare themselves for the appearance of the Savior. Now that one place uh, is the center place, but with its supporting stakes. He says, <clears throat> uh, to prepare themselves for the appearance of the Savior by learning through his inspired servants the things which are pleasing to him and purifying themselves from all things which he hates. They will build unto him a holy temple of necessity, some form of government, politically that is, must be set up among them as they will exist in a national as well as in an ecclesiastical capacity. This government will be a theocracy, or in other words, the kingdom of God, the political kingdom. The laws, ordinances, regulations, etc. will be under the direction of God's priesthood, and the people will progress in arts, sciences, and everything that will produce happiness, promote union, and establish them in strength, righteousness, and everlasting joy. Can you see that picture now? Now, when you go back to Jackson County and you build the center place, this is either by the, by the conversion of the American Gentiles, and I suspect conversion in that situation means more than 50% of them. So that you have, by the voice of the people, if they were to repent to that degree, the uh, will of the people saying, let's change the order of things to the Zion order. And in that Zion order, then uh, you would take Wall Street and you would put it under consecration and move it to Jackson County. That'd be a rough one. <laughs> You'd take Madison Avenue 
and uh, you'd make a missionary tool out of it. And you'd take Washington, D.C., and you would change the order of party politics to that of the government of God, and you would center that in Jackson County. Now, that's a real transformation, see. And it would take a rather significant conversion in numbers of the people of this land. But they could do it if they would embrace the gospel and be taught correct principles, and they could peacefully build on from the order of freedom the Founding Fathers gave to us in the great order of, of uh, free enterprise economics and, and perfect those in embracing and developing the vision of Zion and the principles of Zion. They could do that. And on that event, then, the Gentiles would be a blessed nation and a blessed people on this land forever, see. Now, if they don't do that, <clears throat> if they don't do that, then what? Then the judgments of God will eventually come upon them, and the Book of Mormon makes it very clear it's when the cup of their iniquity is full. I don't know what full means, but I wonder. <clears throat> I wonder about that one, see. All right, uh, and then under those conditions of judgment, which bring about warfare against Zion. And when warfare against Zion begins, the coming of the Assyrian and the trampling of enemy boots on this soil and the cleansing of this land until eventually all lyings and deceivings and envies and priestcrafts and whoredoms, as Jesus said to the Nephites, will be done away. And then you will be ready now under those circumstances to build the New Jerusalem. And it will be, as he said then, more than four walls in preaching. It will be an order of economics. It will be an order of government. It will be an order then that centers in the house of the Lord. Okay? Now he says, now on the other hand, to the rejection of this gospel, which shall be preached to all the world as a witness for the coming of Christ, the world will increase in confusion, doubt, and horrible strife. The darkness upon their minds in relation to eternal things will become blacker. Nations will engage in frightful and bloody warfare, and the crimes that are now becoming so frequent will be of continual occurrence. The ties that bind together families and kindreds will be disregarded and violated, and the, very, and the passions of human nature will be put to their vilest uses. Is that a good commentary on today? Go home and read your newspapers written in 1859, okay? Now, he talks about these two developing things, the building of Zion and the program in the world of deterioration and disintegration. And then he finally brings it down now to the time approaching the second coming. And he says this, we may consider the inhabitants of the earth at the time immediately preceding the coming of Christ under three general divisions. And this is a simplification. There's more to it than this, but this is a basis to start and a basic statement accurate in its basic uh, ideas. There will be then, you consider them in three general <coughs> divisions. First, the saints of God gathered in one place on the western continent called Zion busily preparing for his appearance in their midst as their Redeemer, who had shed his blood for their salvation, now coming to reign over them and to reward them for their labors in establishing his government. See, we get the idea that Christ is going to come and do it. Now, what does Penrose think? He's going to come and reward us for doing it. You see that? And that's a little different ballgame. Now he says the second group then consists of the Jewish people gathered to Jerusalem and also expecting the Messiah. Some of them will believe, and there will be a church, a true church over there. And there is one there now, you know of them. But there will be a Jewish church, and we'll get into that this evening as we talk about, uh, about the, Revel the John Revelation's vision of it, seems. He says... Uh, but not believing, that is, some of them, the, the nation as a whole, though, not believing that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God, and being in danger of destruction from their Gentile enemies. So that's the second general group. Now he puts everyone else in the third class. 
He says, the, the third then consists of the corrupt nations and kingdom of men, who, rejecting the light of the gospel, are unprepared for the Lord's advent and are almost ripe for destruction. Oh, so, you, so you've got the Latter-day Saints, you've got the Jews, and you've got the world. Now, that's an oversimplification, but take it from that. All right, now he says, among the first mentioned of these three classes of men, the Lord will make his appearance first. So where does he start? He starts with Zion, right? And that appearance will be unknown to the rest of mankind. He will come to the temple prepared for him, and his faithful people will behold his face, hear his voice, and gaze upon his glory. From his own lips they will receive further instructions. We'll be like the Nephites listening to the Messiah and receive further instructions for the development and beautifying of Zion and for the extension and sure stability of his kingdom. So when he comes, what does he come for? Reward them for what they've done and give revelation for the extension of that program. Now this is a building thing, see. You're building the millennial kingdom. And we need to have that posture in our minds and get to the work where we can now and build to become an enzyme and build and help each other to sanctify our souls. See? All right, now his next appearance, after these appearances in Zion, and these are multiple, not just one. There's many. We'll get to that now. His next appearance will be among the distressed and nearly vanquished sons of Judah. At the crisis of their fate, when the hostile troops of several nations are ravaging the city and all the horrors of war are overwhelming the people of Jerusalem. This is the abomination of desolation in its second fulfillment, as we talked about yesterday. He will set his feet upon the Mount of Olives, which will cleave and part asunder at his touch. Attended by a host from heaven, he will overthrow and destroy the combined armies of the Gentiles and appear to the worshiping Jews as the mighty deliverer and conqueror so long ex uh, expected by their race. And while love, gratitude, awe, and admiration swell their bosoms, the deliverer will show them the tokens of his crucifixion and disclose himself as Jesus of Nazareth, who they had reviled and whom their fathers put to death. Then will unbelief depart from their souls, and a nation will be born in a day. They will be baptized for the remission of sins, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and the government of God, as established in Zion, in fact, the whole order of things, the law of consecration, the holy order, and all of it, and the government of God as established in, in Zion will be set up among them, no more to be thrown down forever. Heber C. Kimball said, for example, that the prophet talked in his presence on two occasions about the great council of God. That's how he called it. The great council of God that will be held at Jerusalem. Uh, when the two great poles of millennial power, Zion, the city of Zion, and Jerusalem, are united together in the millennial kingdom. It will be done at a great council of God at Jerusalem. All right, now, his coming to the Jews then gets the second program in, and it's their sequence in the development. It's develops along, and one thing happens and another, and you finally go then to Jerusalem. Now he says then, the great and crowning advent of the Lord will be subsequent to these two appearances. It's going to take place after he's come to Zion, and after he's come to the Jews. It won't be many months after he comes to the Jews, but there will be a period of months involved after he comes to the Jews, before he comes in glory in the clouds of heaven. And he says, but who can describe it in, the, in uh, the language of mortals. The tongue of man falters and the pen drops in the hand of the writer as the mind is wrapped in contemplation of the sublime and awful majesty of his coming to take vengeance on the ungodly and to reign as king of the whole earth. He comes, the earth shakes, the tall mountains tremble, the mighty deep rolls back to the north as in fear, the rent skies glow like molten brass. He comes, the dead saints burst forth from their tombs, and those who are alive and remain are caught up 
with them to meet him. The ungodly rush to hide themselves from his presence and call upon the quivering rocks to cover them. He comes with all the hosts of the righteous glorified. The breath of his lips strike death to the wicked. This is the manifestation of his glory. His glory is as a consuming fire. <clears throat> the proud and the rebellious are a stubble, and they are burned and left neither root nor branch. Now those are genealogical terms. To be left neither root means you'll be cut off in respect to your ancestry in the sacred covenants of the house of the Lord and the holy order. To be cut off in the sense of branch means in respect to posterity. See that? He sweeps the earth as with the besom of destruction. He deluges the earth with the fiery floods of his wrath, and the filthiness and the abominations of the world are consumed, and Satan and his dark hosts are taken and bound. The prince of the power of the air has lost his dominion. He whose right it is to reign has come, and the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. All right, that's basically the program now of the second coming. <clears throat> Where do we as Latter-day Saints fit? <clears throat> what is our obligation? How are we correlated then with this greatest work of all works that will renew the earth, <clears throat> renovate it, cleanse it of iniquity, and establish righteousness and universal peace throughout the earth? How are we involved? We're the tribe of Ephraim, the birthright tribe. And uh, the program then largely begins with us, does it not? <clears throat> and it will begin then with the Lord coming out finally and beginning to do a little house cleaning. And I'd like to turn now and <clears throat> complete some of the stuff on Isaiah that we wanted to get to yesterday and see the Book of Mormon contribution on some of these things. Uh, <clears throat> Nephi, in Second Nephi, quotes much of Isaiah. Second Nephi 12 is Isaiah 2. And then from that chapter on, he runs through and includes 13 more chapters. He includes Isaiah chapters 2 through 14 in that unit. And uh, he makes it very, very clear that these chapters are to be fulfilled in our day. And he also makes it very, very clear that the time will come when we awaken spiritually and study the Book of Mormon and understand finally what Isaiah is all about. Now note what he says here in 2 Nephi 25, verse uh, 7. Behold, I proceed with mine own prophecy according to my plainness, in the which I know that no man can err. Nevertheless, in the days that the prophecies of Isaiah shall be fulfilled, men shall know of a surety at the times when they shall come to pass. All right, now, Isaiah has got to cease being a covered-up book, right? And we'll know. And he goes on to say, Wherefore, they are of great worth unto the children of men, and he that supposeth that they are not, unto him will I speak particularly, and confine my words unto my own people. So he's giving us a commentary on Isaiah with a particular slant uh, that's applicable to his own people. He says, For I know that they shall be of great worth unto them in the last days, for in that day shall they understand them. Wherefore, for their good I have written them. Now, they're going to take place in the last days. These things are prophecies about the last days. And we finally wake up when we, they begin to be fulfilled, and we say, Well, you know, Isaiah talked about it. It's been in the Book of Mormon all the time. And I got through those Isaiah passages. <clears throat> I faithfully got my eyeball over every one of them. But boy, they didn't get past my eyeballs until you come to experience, and they will come when we will come to experience. All right, now from that point on then, Nephi, having quoted these chapters, then begins to give us his own prophetic commentary about Isaiah. And this is important, so read and study what he says from verse 25. I mean, chapter 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29, 
and 30. They're all commentaries on this, this big bulk of chapters, this, this 13 un, chapter of 13, a unit of 13 chapters in Isaiah, see. It's all commentary on that. To, under, to see uh, Nephi's view of them as he drew then from them in his prophetic statement. All right, now, as he makes this prophetic statement, then, then he goes on, he talks about the restoration of the gospel in, third, in 2 Nephi 27. Then he's talking about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the coming forth of the sealed portion, the two things. If you read it carefully, you'll find that he's talking about the coming forth of the two volumes, the Book of Mormon and the sealed portion. We'll come back to that. And then in 2 Nephi 28, he has some commentaries to say on the people of our day. Now keep in mind that, that Nephi saw our day, and he saw it as the Lord sees it, uh, with its vanity and its pride and its corruption. And he also sees the Latter-day Saints as the Lord sees them. And he writes then rather pointedly, uh, about our time and our day. Now, in Joseph Smith's day, you could largely read 2 Nephi 28 and uh, point your finger to the Gentile sectarian churches. But when you come to our day and you really study 2 Nephi 28, that finger has a thumb that points backwards. <laughs> and... Uh, as you study it out in that sense then, and read it in the proper sense, we must read it then with an eye to ourselves. And let me tell you why that's important. Uh, let's start, for example, with verse 5. And they deny the power of God, the Holy One of Israel. Well, I'm not commenting, I just want to read it. And they say unto the people, Hearken unto us, and hear our precepts, and behold, there is no God today, etc., etc. Let's read verse 7 now. <laughs> yea, and they shall be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and that she be well with us. And verse 8, And there shall also be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry. Nevertheless, fear God. He will justify in committing a little sin. You can get by this month's home teaching. Yea, lie a little, take advantage of one another because of his words, dig a pit for thy neighbor, there is no harm in this, and do all these things, for tomorrow we die. And if it so be that we are guilty, God will beat us with a few stripes, and at last we'll be saved in the kingdom of God. This rationalizing program. See, the, pave, the road to hell is paved by this kind of thought. All right, read again, verse uh, 9. Yea, and there shall be many which shall teach after this manner false and vain and foolish doctrines, and shall be puffed up in their hearts and seek deep to hide their counsels from the Lord, and their works shall be in the dark. And then finally, verse 14, just to give you the flavor, out, and they wear stiff necks and high heads, and because of pride and wickedness and abominations, and hoard them as they have all gone astray, save it be a few who are the humble followers of Christ. Now there's a key. Who are the humble followers of Christ? Nevertheless, they, they uh, uh, are led in that in many instances they do err because they are taught by the precepts of men. They don't get pure doctrine. All right, finally then, verse 15. Oh, the wisdom, oh the, oh, the wise and the learned and the rich that are puffed up in pride in their hearts, and all those who preach false doctrine, and all those who commit whoredoms, who pervert the right ways of the Lord, woe, woe be unto them, saith the Lord God Almighty, for they shall be thrust down to hell. <clears throat> now, at that point, then Nephi begins to write about Zion. <clears throat> And he does so without breaking stride. He leaves the context which he has set in those verses that I've read and others. And he issues warnings in that context to those people of whom he is speaking. 
and it's plain that he's speaking of those who call themselves Zion. Now, is there reason then to say that we maybe need to read this with an eye to ourselves? Note, there's no breaking of stride. There's no changing of the context. There's no new chapter. There's no new no staying. Now that now we will talk about another side of the coin and talk about the good people. He just puts this whole thing in the same basket in the whole explanation. He doesn't break stride. He goes right on through and he says unto them in that time then, uh, <clears throat> Woe unto them that turn aside the, the just for a thing of naught. And he says, For the day shall come that the Lord will speedily visit the inhabitants of the earth. But behold, the inhabitants of the earth uh, shall repent of their wickedness and abominations. He'll not be destroyed. Behold, that great and abominable church should fall. The kingdom of the devil must shake. And he says, But behold, at that day shall he rage in the hearts of the children of men and stir them up into anger. And others will he pacify and lull them away into carnal security that they will say all is well in Zion. Now, where is he broke stride and where is it? I'm going to talk about another group. He hasn't. You see that? In the same breath, he says, and others he will pacify and lead them away into carnal security, and they shall say, all is well in Zion. Zion prospers, all is well, and thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them down to hell. Now note, for example, in verse 24, then he says, therefore woe be unto though unto him that is ease in Zion. Now he's talking then about a world situation where it is apparent that the saints are enmeshed with the world. They are in the world and in many ways part of it. They haven't forsaken Babylon. They're still there. They're still part and parcel of that situation which he condemns. And he says, Therefore, woe unto him that is at ease in Zion. Woe unto him that crieth all is well. <clears throat> woe unto him that hearkeneth unto the precepts of men and denieth the power of God and the gifts of the Holy Ghost. You teach with learning what you got with your Ph.D. degree. You teach then the learning of the world. And you don't teach what the Book of Mormon says is the gospel. It isn't what you teach. Sometimes it's what you don't teach. There's a lot of good in the learning of the world. But the learning of the world doesn't talk about that you need to really come to Christ and that if you get to Christ, you'll enjoy the gift of the Holy Ghost and that you'll have the gifts of the Holy Ghost with you and you'll have the love of God and you'll be born and transformed. They don't do that. And when you have a person then who is merely teaching then this other stuff and who doesn't teach the divine formula of rebirth and spiritual renewal and the gifts of the Spirit, and the reliance on the gifts of the Spirit, and on the spirit of revelation, and on the challenge to sanctify yourself in Christ, not just the Ben Franklin formula of coping with your sin. When he doesn't do that, then he's merely preaching the manner of the world. See, now note what the Lord says about him. Woe unto him that hearkens to the precepts of men, and denieth the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Yea, woe unto him that saith, We have received, and we need no more. Now, this will take place, may I suggest, at a time when the Lord, having sanctified his saints in some measure, will bring forth other scriptures, namely the sealed portion. Now, just put that in your mind for a minute and let me discuss it with you and see how it bounces around. All right, they will say, Woe unto him that saith we receive, we have received, i.e. from Joseph Smith, and we need no more. And in fine, woe unto all those who tremble and are angry because of the truth of God. For behold, he that is built upon the rock receiveth it, that is, this truth of God that he's speaking about, with gladness. And he that is built upon a sandy foundation trembleth, lest he should fall. Woe unto him that shall say, we have received the word of God, and we need no more of the word of God. Now, what is he talking about? He's talking about a situation where the church is saying all is well in Zion, and they're prospering and, and all of that, and they're relying more on 
the precepts of man and on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and he's going to bring forth some other stuff and begin giving it to them. And they don't want it. They don't want it. They say, we have received the word of God. That is, I, Ethan, Joseph Smith, we got it here in the Book of Mormon in the DNC, and we need no more of the word of God, for we have enough. For behold, thus saith the Lord God, I will give unto the children of men line upon line and precept upon precept. Now, hold on to that one in your mind and let me turn, for example, uh, to Ether chapter 4 with you. Now, Ether chapter 4 is the uh, chapter that deals with the sealed portion. Some people think that the sealed portion will not come forth until the millennium. Let me suggest to you a different view, that when the Lord begins to sanctify his people as a means now of strengthening and building them, those who meet the challenge of discipline and faith and getting the gifts of the Spirit, and who are this righteous remnant of which we have, whom we have spoken, see, then he will bring forth to them this portion as a means of strengthening and building Zion. Now, with that in mind, let me turn to Ether 4 here. Ether 4 deals now with the subject of uh, the uh, sealed portion. And let's start here, for example, with verse 6. And the Lord said unto me, They shall not go forth unto the Gentiles, that is, this sealed portion, they shall not go forth unto the Gentiles, until the day that they shall repent of their iniquity and become clean before the Lord. All right, they're not going to go forth until you get a clean people. And in that day that they exercise faith in me, saith the Lord, even as the brother of Jared did, that they may become sanctified in me, then will I manifest unto them the things which the brother of Jared saw even to the unfolding unto them of all my revelations. And that includes all his teachings to the Nephites, as you find in 3 Nephi 26. He says, all the revelations. Thus, uh, uh, and he says, and he that will contend, now ask yourself the question, under what circumstances will this be brought forth? And he that will contend against the word of the Lord. What word of the Lord? The word of the Lord that he is now bringing forth, see, let him be accursed. And he that shall deny these things, let him be accursed. For unto them will I show no greater things, saith the Lord, uh, saith Jesus Christ, rather, for I am he who speaketh, see. And so, is it implying that, that you wait till the full universal reign of righteousness? Or is he going to bring it forth where people then will look at toward it and say, I don't want it. And then those people who do that and who back off, then he says unto them, Well, I show no greater things, saith Jesus Christ, for I am he who speaketh. He's telling us that. And then he goes on to say, And he that believeth, verse 10, He that believeth not my words, believeth not my disciples. And the, if it so be that I do not speak, judge ye, for he shall know that it is I that speaketh at the last day. Now, in that context, let's come to verse 13 and note what he's saying. Come unto me, O ye Gentiles. Now, in the Book of Mormon, there are places where the word Gentile applies to the American people in general and to Western civilization in general. And then there are those... Uh, places where the word Gentile applies to the saints who are of Gentile culture but of the blood of Ephraim. Now, in this case, he's talking about the latter. Come unto me, O ye Gentiles, and I suspect it can be in, expanded to include all the Gentiles because they are all invited. Come unto me, O ye Gentiles, and I will show unto you the greater things, the knowledge which is hid up because of iniquity. Come unto me, O house of Israel, and it shall be made manifest unto you how great things the Father hath laid up for you from the foundation of the world, and it hath not come unto you because of unbelief. Behold, when ye shall read, rend the veil of unbelief, which doth cause you to remain in your awful state of wickedness. Now that applies to us, 
then we've got some thinking to do, see. And he says, and hardness of heart and blindness of mind, then uh, shall the great and marvelous things which have been hid up from the foundation of the world from you, yea, uh, when you shall call upon the Father in my name with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, then shall ye know that the Father hath remembered the covenant which he hath made unto your fathers, O house of Israel. And then shall my revelation, which, was given, which I caused to be written by my servant John, that is John the Revelator, be unfolded in the eyes of all the people. Remember, when ye see these things, ye shall know that the time is at hand, and that they shall be made manifest in very deed. Now, can you see that? It indicates, clearly implies, that these further things come forth as the cleansing of Zion gets underway, as the remnant begins to get sanctified, then to that group, then these things are given. And to those then who reject it and harden their hearts, they'll receive no more than what's in the Book of Mormon. And they'll say, we have received the Word of God, and we need no more. Now, with that background, let me turn to 2 Nephi 27. I said, uh, is that 4 o'clock? I'll quit after this. <laughs> I told you we were going to run out of time. We've only got 27 hours. <laughs> All right. Now, in third Nef I mean, 2 Nephi 27, it deals with the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the seal portion. Now, you read carefully that chapter, and I'm not going to take the time to discuss the whole of it and, and uh, so forth, but... But I want you to read that carefully and study it over thoughtfully and prayerfully. In the first part of the, of the chapter, he does deal with the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. He tells the story from Isaiah 29 about sending the, uh, the uh, characters from the plates to the learned, which amounts then to Anthon and Mitchell and so forth, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And, uh, they say, I can't read a sealed book and all that, and you know the story. Now in verse 19, Wherefore it shall come to pass that the Lord God will deliver again the book and the words that are to him that is not learned, and this is the prophet Joseph, and the man that is not learned shall say, I am not learned. Then shall the Lord God say unto him, The learned shall not read them, for they have rejected them, and I am able to do mine own work. Wherefore thou shalt read the words which I shall give unto thee. Touch not the things which are sealed, for I will bring them forth in mine own due time, for I will show unto the children of men that I am able to do mine own work. Wherefore, when thou hast read the word, now these are instructions of the prophet Joseph Smith, which I have commanded thee, and obtained the witnesses which I have promised unto thee, then shalt thou seal up the book again and hide it up unto me, that I may preserve the words which thou hast not read, until I see fit in mine own wisdom to reveal all things unto the children of men." And he's going to reveal all things, see. All right, he says, For behold, I am God, and I am a God of miracles, and I will show unto the world that I am the same yesterday, today, and forever, and I work among the children of men according to their faith. Now verse 24 is another ball game. And again. Now, this is a definite break. And again it shall come to pass that the Lord shall say unto him that shall read the words that shall be delivered him. All right, this has reference to the sealed portion. Okay? It's subsequent to, and uh, you're on another time schedule. And again the Lord will say unto him, that shall read the words, for as much as this people, now what's the context of this people? may not be talking just about the Gentiles alone. It may be talking about the thing that Nephi is talking about in 2 Nephi 28 when he says there's a lot of secularism in the church, where we draw near to the Lord with our mouth and with our lips to honor him and removed our hearts far from him, see. For as much as this people draw near unto me with their lips, and uh, with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the precepts of man, not by the gifts and power of the Spirit, therefore 
I will proceed to do a marvelous work and a wonder. Now that marvelous work and a wonder, according to the angel Moroni to Joseph Smith, is a work subsequent to the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Let me turn here to the Messenger and Advocate, where Oliver Cowdery now writes about the visit of the angel Moroni. And he says this, Therefore, says the Lord, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. The wisdom of their wise shall perish, the understanding of their prudence shall be hid, for according to his covenants which he made with his ancient saints, his people, the house of Israel, must come to the knowledge of the gospel and own their Messiah, whom their fathers rejected, and with them the fullness of the Gentiles be gathered in uh, to rejoice in one fold under one shepherd. Now, this great gathering of Israel hasn't yet taken place. It's and the marvelous work and a wonder it isn't just the restoration of the gospel. It is a marvelous work, and I heartily agree with Elder Grand Richards in calling a book the marvelous work and a wonder, see. But now note what he says. This cannot be brought about until first certain preparatory things have been accomplished. You can't get the marvelous work and the wonder, which is not the Book of Mormon. It's the gathering of Israel. It's the building of Zion. It's the turning of things upside down with a new order of society and of government, of law. It's the endowment of glory. It's this marvelous thing that finally ushers in the millennial period. See, that's the marvelous work and a wonder. Take a concordance and look through the Book of Mormon under the word marvelous and read all the passages where it's used, and that's the context in which it's written. That's it. You see that? It puts it in this latter day when you're going to finally redeem Israel and establish Zion. That is the marvelous work and a wonder. And the endowment of Zion with glory, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Now, this cannot, Moroni said, be done until first certain preparatory things are accomplished. For so has the Lord purpose in his own mind. And then he talks about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Okay? Now, you see that picture of things then? Now, in that sense, then, from that point on, then, he talks about the, the, the situation in relation to the, to the uh, coming forth of the sealed portion. And he says this, The wisdom of their wise shall perish. The understanding of the prudent shall be hid. Because you're going to put a new a program in operation. You're going to put Zion in place of the Gentile culture, which has gone into decadency. And you're going to bring the endowment of glory. And he goes on to say, Woe unto them that seek deep in their counsel, to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the works of darkness. That's one woe he pronounces. And then he pronounces another one. And note what it says. And they say also, and that's the second thing, also, surely, your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. Now, he uses a simile there. The potter's clay. When a potter doesn't make a perfect instrument the first time, and he looks at it and he's brought it forth, and it isn't perfect completely as it ought to be, what does he do? He throws it back into the ground and remixes it and brings it forth. Now, the Lord, through the prophet Joseph Smith, restored his gospel in this dispensation. Many things he had hardly restored before we began to back away from him. He restored the law of consecration and stewardship. It didn't get off the ground. He organized the school of the prophets in, de in January of 1833. He disorganized it before the spring was out because of the contention. He, or he brought forth many other things, and we have backed off from that. And the vessel that has been molded is not a perfect vessel according to the original standard. And so when this time comes that he sets his hand again the second time and the marvelous work is done, he's going to throw the whole box back into the pot and remold the doctrine and remold the organization and bring forth the instrument of perfection, namely Zion. And those who live to see that happen will say, surely, you're turning the things upside down, and it will be a turning of things upside down, shall be esteemed, he says, as the potter's clay. And then the Lord answers them, 
But behold, I will show unto them, saith the Lord of hosts, that I know their works. They're, they're working from the premise of humanism and secularism and materialism. I know their works. He says, For shall the work say of him that made it, and uh, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say to him that framed it, he hath no understanding? He says, But behold, saith the Lord of hosts, I will show unto the children of men that it is yet a little season, and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as the forest. That's when really the land of Israel really blossoms. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book. And that deaf isn't deaf who's got something plugged up up here. These are the deaf people who have ears to hear and cannot hear, and many of them will be Latter-day Saints. And when this thing finally gets through and they've remolded it and they begin to back up and take a look at the perfected order, then the deaf shall hear the words of the book and the eyes of the blind, and here again we're not talking about actual blindness, we're talking about spiritual blindness, shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. They'll finally come and get their peepers open. And the meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice. For surely as the Lord liveth, they shall see that the terrible one is brought to naught. So he puts this in the context of the warfare against Zion. And the scorner is consumed, and all the watch for iniquity are cut off. And they that made a man an offender for a word, and lay a snare for him that reproved in the gate, and turned aside the just thing to not. Therefore thus saith the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall not now wax, uh, Jacob shall not, not now be ashamed, neither shall his face wax pale. But when he seeth his children, the work of my hands, in the midst of them, when you begin to gather things to Zion, then he says, and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, and shall fear the name of the Lord, and they also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding. Those who have been backward in receiving this, they'll finally come around and get a little understanding, and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. See, Now can you read 2 Nephi 27? Study it over again. I challenge you to go to the Lord in the spirit of fasting and prayer and say, is that really what it says? Are we involved in that kind of a scenario for the future? See, I run over. I apologize. I won't do it next time. Friday afternoon, <laughs> but if all goes well, we'll try and see you at 6 o'clock. And again, I just want to, with Helen May, join with you in expressing deep appreciation for being here. If I don't get a chance to say it again, you have a spirit here in Snowflake that they don't have on the Wasatch Front. You have an innocence and a purity that's here that they don't have there. And uh, many of these things don't apply to you as much as they do to others in other areas. I can feel it. I can just literally feel the spirit that's here. May God bless you, sustain you, times to come particularly, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. <coughs>